March is one of the busiest months in the United States election calendar. Donald J. Trump and Joe Biden appear to be all but certain to win their respective parties' nominations. So what does that spell for the rest of the world? Hello and welcome to Roundtable. I'm Enda Brady. Now, if there were any doubts at the start of this year as to who would contest the US presidential race, there seem to be hardly any now. As we head towards the November polls, can anyone prevent a rematch of the 2020 US election? Fresh from a Supreme Court victory, former US President Donald Trump has come out swinging. He praised the top court's ruling that the state of Colorado cannot ban him from its ballot over the January 6, 2021 Capitol riot. I want to start by thanking the Supreme Court for its unanimous decision today. It was a very important decision. We're very well crafted. And I think it will go a long way toward bringing our country together, which our country needs. March the 5th saw the most states hold presidential primary elections to select party nominees, an event known as Super Tuesday. On the Republican side, even in the run-up to Super Tuesday, Trump had a commanding lead over his only remaining contender, former UN Ambassador Nikki Haley. The results of Super Tuesday bring him even closer to winning the Republican ticket for November's general election. Meanwhile, his likely opponent in November, US President Joe Biden, is running pretty much unopposed in the Democratic Party primaries. He's been more busy trying to find a peaceful resolution to the war in Gaza. I'm hoping so. We're still working real hard at it. Not there yet. But both men are fighting an even bigger opponent, their age. At 81, Biden is the oldest president the US has had. A recent New York Times poll showed 73% of respondents either strongly or somewhat agree that Biden is too old to be an effective president, compared to 42% who said the same about Trump. But Trump, who at 77 is not much younger than Biden, has himself made some startling errors lately. So every time I do that, or I'll say, our president, Barack Hussein Obama, now I do that because, you know, that makes a point. Do we understand that, right? Because a lot of people say he's running the country. I don't personally think so. So with two elderly men competing for the world's most powerful office, how should the rest of the world be positioning itself? Well, let's meet our guests. John Scardino is the spokesperson for Democrats Abroad UK. He joins us from London. In Nashville, Tennessee, in the US, is political journalist Scotty Nell Hughes. And here with me in the studio is Greg Swenson. He's chairperson of Republicans Overseas UK. A very warm welcome to Roundtable to all of you. Scotty, we'll start with you first. Mr. Trump looks unstoppable. Am I right? I think you are right. And with the Supreme Court's decision, unanimous decision that came down yesterday, uh, the only hopes, and I don't know if it was the Democrats or the never Trumpers like Nikki Haley's dreams of stopping the Trump train from going all the way to the ballot in November were basically derailed and permanently derailed. I think that liberal tears right now that are falling across the United States right now because they were hoping that the Supreme Court would rule on the side of the Colorado judge or the Illinois traffic court judge that tried to take Trump off the ballot, I think we're going to see, whether you like it or not, America, a race between the very senior Joe Biden and Donald Trump. And there's just nothing at this stage that can stop it. And it's a long way to go until November. I mean, what's the public's appetite like, Scotty? Have people had enough of these two men already? Well, that's the interesting part. We say it's a long way to go till November. I don't think we've stopped running since 2020. That has been a constant campaign for both sides of the aisle. 
So do the American people right now, what is their attitude? Well, unfortunately, uh, their attitude is not happy because people are realizing that in the streets of America today, they feel less safe. They have less money in the bank account. And even though in 2020, we were in the middle of a pandemic at this stage, people today are probably less unhappy with their lives and their quality of life than they were four years ago. And that right there is what is going to cause. Donald Trump could not do anything. In fact, he could probably stay in his gold-plated basement for the next seven months and not do a single thing to election day and win just because of the actions or the lack of action that the Biden administration is doing on current hot topics and policies that are not affecting just the beltway, but it's affecting the backyards of every single American. And that right there is the reason why Democrats are very fearful of Donald Trump being in this race. John, are you fearful of Trump then? No, I, in fact, I, I think as far as this um, ballot decision is concerned, our attitude is, you know, on the ballot, off the ballot, whatever, uh, bring it on. Um, you know, we've got a clear difference between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party of the 21st century. Um, they are very different, stark contrasts in uh, the kind of leadership and stability and thoughtfulness that Joe Biden offers and the kind of chaos and lack of focus that uh, Donald Trump offers, as, as he demonstrated in his own term in office, and it was chaotic and all over the place. There were no policies. And at the end of it, when he ran for re-election, the party decided we're not even going to have a platform. Why bother? It'll just be whatever Donald Trump says it is. And that's, that's the biggest difference between, I think, between Joe Biden and, and Donald Trump. I think Trump is a much better decision maker, a much better leader, and much more qualified. John, Scotty mentioned the American economy. I mean, inflation's running high, interest rates are high, cost of living crisis. All of this plays into Trump's hands, doesn't it? That he can say to people, look, this is what Joe Biden has done. I think things are getting a lot better and people are beginning to feel that. I, I do think, look, Joe Biden came in in the, in the crisis. There's no, no question about that. I think he has moved mountains since he's been in office, the, the unemployment picture has gotten much, much better. Personal finances have gotten much better, particularly in the last in the last three months or so. And I think people are beginning to express that in uh, in polls and, and in surveys. Um, so I think that the picture is getting better. I, I was interested to see that one of the issues that Biden has decided to take on is uh, shrinkflation, which you may have seen. He is after uh, companies that uh, that are producing smaller products and charging greater prices. And I think that's something that we can all feel um, is, is an annoyance and more than an annoyance. I mean, it hits you right in the pocketbook. Greg, you're a Trump man. He's had a great Super Tuesday. I mean, it looks like a home run the whole way, doesn't it? Yeah, I think people are looking toward the general election at this point. I think that, you know, the, the nominations are an afterthought right now. There's, you know, there's an, always a chance the Democrats will rethink Biden. It's too late, obviously. There's no mechanism to do it now. It's too late to have a, a nomination process. And look, I'm not suggesting that it's 100% likely, but you know, they did it in 72 with the vice presidential candidate after the convention. They did it, remember, only in 2020. Bernie Sanders was going to be the candidate. Biden had come in fourth in New Hampshire and fifth in, fourth in Iowa and fifth in New Hampshire. He was a failed candidate. I thought he was dead on arrival. I thought he was going to shut down the campaign. But they realized that Bernie Sanders, the socialist, the Jeremy Corbyn of America, was going to get crushed by Trump in the general election. They sat down. They moved, they moved Bernie aside. They made Joe the candidate, essentially, by getting the endorsement in South Carolina. And it all worked out as, as you know, nine months later. Scotty, I see you cracking a smile there. What do you make of that? Well, I am sure all of my friends around the world right now are getting their popcorn ready to watch the last, the next nine months. I mean, it's probably going to be more entertaining and more switching of partners than probably the Kardashians have done in the last three years. I think what you're going to find out is that during the next, uh, you're going to see both parties right now, whether it's Donald Trump looking at his VP candidate, which for the first time on both sides of the aisle, considering the age of the president, the VP candidate is extremely important, probably even more important on the Republican side, because 
because Donald Trump is looking to this VP candidate to be an outreach, a tool to outreach to some of those demographics that the Republican Party has had traditionally had a very challenging time with. So whether it be a female, uh, an African-American, whatever that contest will be, it's going to be very important for once. It's not just going to be a presidential candidate meant to go out on the spelling bee trail and misspell the word potato. The Republicans are going to look to this VP candidate to probably be a stronger role. And more importantly, unlike what we had with Pence, which is probably part of the reason why we had all the chaos in the 2016 administration of Donald Trump, is he's going to look to his vice president to truly be someone who is going to back him up and back up his his agenda and his policies and push them through. On the Democrat side, I think I still am very, uh, I still think that we're going to see a switch at the DNC of the candidate when they realize the Democrats are not going to lose. They do, especially, and they're not going to lose to Donald Trump. So if they realize that they are so down in the polls in some of these key states like Georgia, Michigan, uh, Pennsylvania, they will make a change of guard. And this will be not enough time for the American people to vet whomever they put in. And they're just going to have to accept the name of who it is versus Donald Trump and their VP candidate. It's going to be extremely exciting, very interesting. I just hope come November, the American people have enough information to make an intelligent decision as to who their pre president should be. So, John, are you going to switch horses? Can we expect a change? <laughs> no, it's a very interesting uh, view of the way that the 2020 election went by um, your Republican guest there, Greg. Uh, I was I was smiling a bit. I, I would say that it went very differently than the description that he gave you. But and I would also say that this talk about another candidate in the Democratic side is, you know, uh, as some people say, horse feathers. You know, there's there's not going to be another candidate. And the Republican strategy is to try to do everything they can to try to depress turnout on the Democratic side as much as they can to badmouth the, their their opponent and to to try to get others to have a, a less uh, favorable view of him and to turn out to decrease the turnout on our side just ever so slightly because they they don't have anything to offer in terms of policies or positive uh, proposals. They're looking to just win based on trying to suppress the turnout a little bit. And and I think that this discussion uh, that comes up from time to time about another candidate replacing Biden or, or something else happening, I think is is just ludicrous. Uh, Joe Biden is, is has been and will be an excellent leader. I expect that he will be a, an excellent president and be able to work with both sides of the aisle as he has done in the past and getting things done uh, for for America and the economy and improving jobs. One one last thing. I'm sorry. I don't mean to to capitalize on the time here, but you know when Donald Trump was in power, he got very very little done. And even when he had an opportunity to get a, a bipartisan bill passed that would have been a big boost to the American infrastructure and created jobs, it was handed to him on a silver platter, and he walked away from it. And there's very little that he actually accomplished during his time in office. Craig, what would you say to that, that Trump achieved nothing? He, I totally disagree. I mean, first of all, Republicans have always felt like the private sector should be the ones creating jobs and develop and, and increasing wages, which is what happened. He liberated the economy. He reduced taxes on corporations and, and individuals. He deregulated. Look what we had. Massive income growth, 6.3 percent just in 2019, more than all the Obama years combined. So that's what that's what the policies are. I, I, and I disagree with John. The first policy he's going to execute when he wins is close the border. I would call that a policy, and I would call that a failed policy of the Biden administration. I mean, they purposely opened the border. We have 10 million illegal aliens. You have. Lake and Riley dead in the at the University of Georgia, thanks to the open border. You have 200 people dying a day from fentanyl poisoning. So I would say policy number one, day one, liberate the energy sector so that you don't have... You we're know, in a climate crisis. We, of course. What was the Trump right. said? Drill, baby, drill. I yeah. mean, we're in a climate crisis and he's going to do this. And, and look, that you know, to the great benefit of the mullahs in Iran and Putin, Jake Sullivan went over and begged Putin to pump more oil before the invasion of Ukraine. Liberating the energy sector is really critical right now. Um, and, and that'll be a day one issue. And then you have closing the border. So petrol prices are 25% higher for Americans. Grocery price prices are 20% higher. That's a Biden inflation. Shrinkflation, as unpleasant as it is, is 
a result of inflation. That's exactly what corporations do. And so, you know, this, it's been a debacle for the economy. It's been a debacle for working people who, who's a greater percentage of their paycheck goes to food and, and gasoline or petrol than, than it does for rich people. So look, th this is a real hardship on Americans. And I think you'll see that at the polls. They're going to look at the policies and they're going to vote for Trump because of his policies. Scotty, let's talk about Europe. What can we expect? I mean, what do you think Europe wants from this US presidential race? I think they want peace. And I think that's something that we did see. Now, granted, there was obviously a lot of ego shifting during the Trump administration because Trump refused to bow down to anybody, um, as we have seen Biden do numerous times to numerous world leaders. But I think we want peace. Um, today, we saw Victoria Nuland uh, resign, say that she's going to be resigning from the Biden administration in three weeks. That is a huge marker, a huge marker to the rest of the world as to where I think the Biden administration realizes that the West campaign in Ukraine right now is taking a major shift than what the United States originally hoped it was going to do when we started, when the invasion started two years ago. So I think you're going to see from a foreign policy standpoint, the world is looking for stability. They're looking for peace, whether we're talking about Ukraine, whether we're talking about in the Middle East, whether we're talking about over in Asia. That was something that existed during Donald Trump, mainly because other world leaders did not want to challenge Trump. They knew that he had a red line and they knew that he was going to follow through with strength and they didn't want to necessarily kick the beast into that mode. But that didn't mean that Donald Trump, Joe Biden, world leaders have very little trust right now in the West, not only backing them up, but because of the policies of the last three years underneath Joe Biden, they don't think we have the capability anymore that if they do get in trouble, if our NATO partners do find themselves in a place of need, that the United States has the capability currently, whether we're talking about the equipment that we have or boots on the ground, to actually give them the support that we promise. And I think that's what the world is looking for in this. And I think if you ask world leaders, they would love to keep Joe Biden. If you ask the people of Europe, they would like to see someone like Donald Trump in office because they need someone to bring peace to their land right now. What do you think of that, John? Is that is that your take on Europe? No, and, I, and I, with all due respect to Scotty, I, I, I don't know you, I'm, so, so forgive me, but um, you were introduced as a journalist. You clearly have a very strong bias towards um, towards this particular candidate. Um, um, so I, I've I feel a little bit like I, I would question some of the, the views that you've presented, but um, I, I think that that one of the things about Joe Biden is that he has been around in in politics and in the policy development process and reaching out to leaders in many countries. He's worked with almost every single leader of Israel, for example, um, since Golda Meir, which is a, a line he often quotes. You know, he has he has personal relationships with people that are leading countries around the world. Um, I, I do think that, that Donald Trump has, a, has quite a big ego and he is in politics um, more for himself rather than to serve the country. And I, I, it concerns me greatly that um, uh, his, his ambition is, is more for his own um, promotion than it is for the benefit of, of um, the citizens of America. Greg, is that a fair point? People see Biden as someone who's going to work for the average American and Trump is in it for Trump PLC? I mean, Trump, I mean, he did come up with the phrase, make America great again, right? I, I, I'll give him that much. And, and look, you might not like some of the outbursts or some of the unfiltered, you know, rhetoric, but that doesn't matter. What matters is to, you know, peace and prosperity, which we had under Trump. We don't have it under Biden. And I think it's important to look at at what President Biden has done versus what Trump has done. The Abraham Accords, great example, right? That delivered peace, at least for a time in the Middle East. The first two years of the Biden administration, the, word, the term Abraham Accords was not permitted to be used in the White House or used on memos. And I think we would have had the Saudis and the Israelis together before October 7th if that wasn't the case. So there, there's a long list of failures from the Biden administration that are affecting average voters, even if you're not a political junkie like the, the people on, on this panel, it, you're going to look at your wallet and you're going to look at the front page and see that there's not peace and prosperity. And I think that's, that's what is gonna be a real challenge for Biden in the general election. Scotty, I want to talk to you about immigration. Do you think that's where Donald Trump will zone in policy-wise? Well 
Just like Democrats want to focus on abortion, uh, Republicans want to focus on immigration. It's definitely an issue, winning issue for both sides. But I do want to bring up one quick thing is, is I think my journalistic integrity was kind of put into question by, by my colleague there. Listen, I'm invited on this show as a commentator. Just like you want to, you go to a restaurant because the chef has good taste. You go to a hairdresser because they have good looks. You go to a journalist and don't think that they don't have opinions. So in this case, I and the reason why I am such a good journalist, the reason why I have good opinions is because I do cover the stories. And I can cover that underneath Donald Trump, we were not in a military operation in Ukraine and Russia. There was no military operation. There was none going on in the Middle East between Gaza. We did not see the chaos that we've had. That is fact. And that is a journalist reporting it. As a commentator, I can say it's because of the leadership of the West. And right now, Make America Great Again meant taking the West out of places they did not need to be, that we actually were observing the Monroe Doctrine and respecting it underneath Donald Trump, which is why immigration is so interesting, because we are seeing every country around the world currently right now mainly having to address their borders being not secure. John, has the Biden administration failed on immigration then? No, I appreciate you bringing this up because from day one, this has been an issue. Joe Biden introduced legislation to try and begin the discussion with Congress to come to a, a compromise solution to address the issues at the border. And he has worked on this repeatedly since he since his very first day in office. Literally, I mean, the, the day he, he stepped into the Oval Office, he sent a bill across to Congress to begin to address the, the, the situation at the border. It is a crisis. And, and he recognizes that, and Republicans in Congress recognize that. Republicans in the Senate and, and have been working with Democrats to come up with some solutions, and they did. Unfortunately, the current Republican candidate asked, told them that, that, that that should be withdrawn. He pulled the rug out from underneath them and said, we don't want to resolve this issue until after November. We want this as an issue to, to run on. And so rather than contributing to trying to find a solution, he wanted to take a political um, stance on this and try to make it for his own benefit rather than trying to come up with some solutions. And this is the kind of thing that, as I was saying earlier, that you can expect from Trump going forward. He is not a productive leader. He is an obstructionist. He doesn't want things to get done that he, that he feels don't necessarily benefit him personally. Greg, just on that immigration point, yeah. so I read there are 8 million people, illegal immigrants in the United States, are predominantly working in agriculture and hospitality, 11 million in total. But those two industries, agriculture and hospitality, if he follows through on what he's saying, he can't deport 8 million people. No, well, what kind of damage would that do to your economy if he starts targeting people who are doing jobs that, you know, a lot of Americans don't want to do. Of course. No, we, immigration is a good thing. We are pro-immigration. We're, we're, we're not pro-illegal immigration. And that's what's happening. So there's, there were already 10 million in the country from decades of, of neglect. There's another 10 plus million that have come in. By the end of his administration, it'll be you know, 11, 12 million. That's it's hard to count the getaways. This is a humanitarian crisis. Now you have criminals from Venezuela that have come into the country, killed poor Lake and Riley a week or two ago at the University of Georgia. This is, the, the border has been turned over to human trafficking cartels and drug cartels. This was done by Biden on purpose. Now, I don't know why he did it, but he did it. Day one, opened up the border. The, they, they, were, they were moving north as soon as he won the election. So this was a deliberate move to open the border. So what Congress Trump has do? nothing Trump to do with shut this. this. Trump handled it in his administration. He had remained in Mexico. The policy was working, consistently coming down in every year of Trump's administration, and then immediately opened up. The numbers don't lie. It went from under a million to two, two to three million a year under Biden. This is a tragedy. That's why he polls at 30 on the border. John, do you think Biden can stop Trump again? Absolutely. Uh, I, I do think as we get uh, beyond the primary and the focus will be just on these two candidates, um, I think it'll be clear to the American people that who the better leader and who the better decision maker is. Um, I would just very quickly just to address the point that Greg just made. Um, Biden's proposals to help solve the border problem have been to propose things like bringing in more 
uh, judges to um, to hear cases and to process people. There have been a number of other uh, solutions like that that have been proposed, but one at once, one after another, um, these things have been have been shot down. There has to be some um, working together with Congress, with the Republican side, in order to to get these things done. Scotty, final question to you. I just want to look at the issue of AI. I saw a picture the other day of Donald Trump apparently posing for a photograph impromptu with some young black guys who he had met. And it turns out it was completely AI generated, but that didn't stop millions of people viewing it, retweeting it, liking it. Do you, do you worry about AI creeping into American politics in this of all years? I absolutely worry about it. I think everyone should be worried about AI into every aspect of their life. I think Americans, but actually anybody, already had a trust issue, not only with their government, but with the process in their government. And this is only going to continue to destabilize and fracture that trust even more because it is so lifelike. And so this is why it's one of those things that I always tell voters, don't make your decision the day of. Don't make your decision based on just one person's opinion or one speech from a politician. You are going to have to do your own research and it's going to have to be extensive if you want to have confidence that the vote that you make when you go into that ballot box is absolutely the correct one. Scotty, John and Greg, thank you all so much for your insight. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Just search for Roundtable. TRT World. And if you like what you see, please do hit that subscribe button. But for now, from me and Brady and all of the team here, goodbye and thank you for watching.